Today is day 27, and the title of this day's entry is Love, Love, and More Love. Are you already thinking of the Beatles? <laughs> Speaking of the UK, I woke up today thinking that love really does cover all. <laughs> wow. It's so much better to give the benefit of the doubt, to hope for the best, to reserve judgment, to imagine how it is for the other person, to allow the one you love to be who they actually are, not the image you wish they were, to give grace, to have sympathy, to find common ground, to be charitable, to celebrate someone else, to choose delight over dissatisfaction. Okay, can I just pause to say, <laughs> let's all tape this to our mirrors today for the next 20 days until the U.S. election is over. <laughs> can we just treat everyone this way, not just our children? There are times to draw boundaries or to put distance between you and someone else, someone toxic. Yes, but even then, a little love from behind the self-protecting wall isn't unwarranted. You can at minimum recognize that the person suffering in their brokenness or mental illness or addiction can't possibly be happy with who they are in that state. In the meantime, slather a little love on yourself while you're at it. It's a good day to be good to you. Love, love, love. Quote of the day. So very well put, Julie. Thank you. You have such a gift with words. Love is the key. Self, self, self is the mantra of the day and is so limiting. Love shall find a day, find a way. Julie Williams Jackson. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a good friend of mine. <laughs> Sustaining thought. All you really need is love. Or at the very least, all you really need is the willingness to love yourself and others. Whew, that was a short one, but I'm going to read it again because it was short and because I want you while you're listening to not just let these words sort of slide over your head. I'm reading this for me this morning. I don't know about you, but Facebook's a hostile place to be in the United States right now. People are ending friendships, they're blocking and banning, they're aggressive, they're using all caps. The all caps key has gotten more of a workout in the last month than I think it has in the history of the internet. There is a sense of being right as the most important feature in any part of the relationship. Having the last word, being the right person, having the right point of view, making the right judgment. And that spirit is something we bring to our families far too often. We start from a premise of, I know better. I know what's right. I know what's required. I know what should be done. And then when we are thwarted or we get blowback from a child, we get angry or we lose that center or we stop seeing the loveliness of the person. We become Self-protecting, self-protecting, not self-loving. It's okay to feel wounded and hurt, but to keep your heart open, to stay open to experiences that are different from your own. So let's read this one more time, and then we're going to talk a lot about what I mean when I'm talking about love and boundaries, because, you know, that's why we're here. One more sip of tea. My voice is still waking up. Okay, here we go. Love, love, and more love. I woke up today thinking that love really does cover all. It's so much better to give the benefit of the doubt, to hope for the best, to reserve judgment, to imagine how it is for the other person, to allow the one you love to be who they actually are, not the image you wish they were. To give grace, to have sympathy, to find common ground, to be charitable, to celebrate someone else, 
to choose delight over dissatisfaction. There are times to draw boundaries or to put distance between you and someone toxic. Yes, but even then, a little love from behind the self-protecting wall isn't unwarranted. You can at minimum recognize that the person suffering in their brokenness or mental illness or addiction can't possibly be happy with who they are in that, in that state. In the meantime, slather a little love on yourself while you're at it. It's a good day to be good to you. Love, love, love. So let's talk about this. You know, when I look at that list that I associate with the notion of love, the bottom line, the core experience that undergirds love is empathy. It's the capacity to stand in the shoes of the other and look out through their eyes at the landscape that they see. What is missing today isn't more fact-checking. It's understanding what animates the passion somebody else is expressing. So let's pick something totally not related to the election. Let's say that you have a parent and you're a child, 10 years old, 12 years old, and you've grown up in a family where somebody's an alcoholic. And you've grown up and you've been tweaked by that experience. When you hit adulthood, and you're starting to put the rubble of your life back together. And this surge of anger, justifiable anger, comes to you. And you're still dealing with this person who has behaved in this addicted, destructive way for your entire childhood. Do you need to hang out with that person? Find common ground. Uh, let's look at the list. Not judge. Hope for the best. Like, does that person deserve that from you? They do. Can you also draw a boundary that is self-loving? You can. Both can exist. You can look at the person who has caused you pain, who has created toxicity in the family system, and still get behind that enough to recognize that a person who is addicted and drinks, or a person who is a chronic gambler, or a person who has had serial affairs and has destroyed the family is operating from some level of deep deficit that has meant that that person doesn't live in a way that is helpful to anyone. That person is trying to solve the gaping hole, the gaping wound with what we would call illegal choices, bad choices that wreck the peace of other lives. Do you stand and let someone dump their toxicity on you? You don't. But in the privacy of your own heart, you can open to imagine life through the lens of someone who when they wake up in the morning, the first thing they think of is alcohol. Or you can think about a person who would repeatedly choose to sabotage the good they intended for their own lives. So there's a attention between standing in the shoes of the other and opening your heart just a little bit to have the capacity to see brokenness, to see somebody's bad choice. And you know, some of the most powerful examples in the world to me are people who have suffered violent crime and have found a way to hold that and still stay open to life. Because here's the thing, people talk a lot about Forgiveness, for example. How can you forgive someone? You know, there's, in fact, this week there's been a lot of talk about forgiveness that I've read related to issues in the current election cycle. And I was thinking about this. You know, we're quick to forgive when the person that we're forgiving is someone we already approve of or care about or who hasn't directly harmed us. It is much harder to forgive your child, your spouse, a parent who's harmed you, who's caused you direct harm. It's hard for us to forgive someone who comes from a completely different point of view than we do, whose basic set of assumptions we don't admire. So forgiveness a lot of times isn't actually forgiveness. It is excusing. It's allowing for. It's tolerating 
because it doesn't have a direct impact on us. When I shared with you um, last week, I think it was, about my friend Lois, who at age 24, we were young, right? She was 23, I think, and I was 22 or 23 and 24. We were young. And um, violent crime, she ended up dead, and it had all the aspects of a violence against a woman. So when Lois's husband, widower, had to grapple with what these men did to his wife, now we're talking about what is forgiveness. Because now he has something to forgive. It was done to him. It was done to him. People on the outside can't, that's not theirs to forgive. He's the one who had to grapple with it. Something was taken from him. He was violated. And so when we're looking at this principle of love, I can from the outside stand in shoes and find out who those two young men were and maybe work up some level of empathy or compassion. But that's not the same as forgiveness. They didn't do anything to me. And it's not mine to give or withhold. So as we're looking at the landscape of our families today, when you have a dynamic with a child, that's where this notion of love, forgiveness, tolerance, creating a little bit bigger space, getting behind the eyes of the child into their shoes and seeing the world the way a five or an eight or a 12 or a 15 year old sees it with the limits they have, why their immaturity would erupt. Sometimes I hear from a parent who will say things like, but she's 10, she knows better. 10, 10? She might theoretically know better, but how much practice does she have with knowing better, with correcting her behavior at the last minute, with holding back anger? I mean, we see grown adults in their 50s and 60s who can't hold back that loathing, that seething, that self-righteous, self-justifying behavior. Why would we think a 10-year-old could do that in the face of a very real in-person encounter with a sibling who took her toy or punched her in the arm or said the one comment that we knew would set her off. I mean, if adults on Facebook can't have control over what they say and do, why do we think our children can? And the only way to help them through that experience to become the kind of people who can know better is to open. It's not to close down, you know? The temper tantrums we're witnessing right now are a result of years of cultivation. The modeling of our leaders, wherever we find them, whether it's, you know, a religious leader, a politician, somebody we listen to on the radio, somebody we read in a book, we become like the number one influence in our lives. So we have to think about the voices we listen to, whose tone of voice, whose content, whose perspective helps us be better people. That's what we're looking for. So where does love come from? Love comes from being the kind of person that generates a feeling of love whenever they're around people. <laughs> That's where it comes from. I had a friend uh, two weeks ago, three, it's more than that now, it's probably a month ago, unfriend me. We've known each other since we were eight years old. And I suddenly noticed she unfriended me. I couldn't figure out why. I know her political positions and mine don't align. She's very active in her point of view. So I immediately made the knee-jerk assumption. She unfriended me. She thinks I don't align with her. She's unfriending all of her friends who don't agree with her. And then I paused and I thought about it. And I thought, she's really excited about this campaign that she's supporting. And I know what that feels like. I've supported campaigns. I've gone on the campaign trail. I've knocked on doors when I've believed in what I've supported. And she's having that experience. It must be so thrilling. And it must be so frustrating to have people that she thought she knew well not see that and not be excited with her. And I don't even like how she's doing it. I don't agree with all of her style of communication. But I just paused and I asked myself, what must that feel like? 
to be animated and feel like you're on the inside track and to really have a vision for what you think would benefit this country. Well, I already know what that feels like. I've done that. We just don't agree. So I sent her a message and I just said, hey, friend, I noticed I was unfriended. I hope we're still good. I don't know if it's just this election season or something else or an accident. Just wanted you to know I'm, I'm thinking about you. She immediately wrote back. She gave me some, you know, explanation that I'm not even sure was the truth, but she felt badly because we're friends. And she said, but you might want to block me for the next six months because I'm, or, you know, however long month, two months, uh, because I'm going to be really going in hard on this election. And I wrote back, I said, I don't need to block you. I love you. I want to know you. I want to understand you. And she wrote back, she says, well, haha, I've blocked you because I can't read what you write, which is funny because I don't do po politics on Facebook anymore. And uh, she laughed when I said that. And you know what's crazy? It's all better. It's all like we're all better. Last week, I commented on something on her wall. There was a question by one of her people and I gave a comment and then I got bashed by all of her friends and she stood up for me because we're friends. There's, we need more of that, right? We need more of that. So if as adults, we can barely negotiate these things where someone has a little bit of a self-protecting tantrum and they go and they ban all their friends and then we're like, oh, I'm so offended. She banned me, so I'm gonna block her. And I read these long diatribes of what the right perspective is based on who you say you are, you know. <laughs> And then we expect children under 18 to get along when they're arguing over who gets to use the computer, something far more personal, far more concrete, far more immediate. I mean, really, really, really. So it's hard to love. Love isn't a theory. It's not a construct. It means you have to reach out beyond what's comfortable for you. It means you have to give up that moment of self-righteousness to see behind the other. It doesn't mean that you tolerate abusiveness. If that friend of mine had come back and said something really hostile and cruel to me in private message, the relationship would have been over. I don't sign up for people to be punishing to me. But that doesn't mean that I couldn't still, from some place in my heart, understand where it was coming from. I don't have to look at her and hate her. You know, you don't have to hate. You don't have to decide that because somebody else has not come to the place yet where they can separate their anxiety from the friendship. And anxiety is what's driving all of this. It's a self-protection. It's a feeling of things being out of control. It's a desire for stability to return. And so we have opinions about that. If someone cannot yet manage that anxiety without being hostile, you don't have to pay attention to that and allow that to come into your heart and your life. But you also don't have to hate. These are people working things out. I don't know. I've lived a long time. I've had a lot of strong opinions. I've held a lot of positions. I've watched online bloodbaths over the smallest ideological differences. I mean, you've watched them. You're a homeschooler. There are bloodbaths over whether or not your child should be allowed to watch fill-in-the-blank TV show. Back in 2005 or six, I wrote a blog post about Harry Potter on my personal blog, not on Brave Writer, and I lost business over it. And do you know what I wrote? I basically was wrestling with whether or not Harry Potter was a great thing for kids to read. And my own child, Noah, walked me into the room of why it was great. And once I read it, I liked it. And I didn't see all of the nefariousness that everyone else saw in 2005 in my world. And I shared about it on my personal blog, not in my company. And we had a month, Cindy will remember, where people dropped us like crazy. There was one specific community in the homeschool world that was well connected with each other and they wrote about the fact that I was not safe for children and we lost customers. We lost links off of blogs and websites over me having a different opinion. We fast forward 11 years and there isn't a homeschooler who doesn't celebrate Harry Potter openly. 
What happened? Well, movies were made, and the series was finished, and we could see where J.K. Rowling was going, and suddenly everybody's okay with it. So I had, you know, the online bloodbaths over there. I got hate. It was the first time I got hate email, which is jarring, <laughs> to say the least. You wake up in the morning, and your inbox is stacked with people telling you that you are leading people into the occult, that you are the handmaid of Satan. That's not fun. But you know what? They were protecting their children. And when your children are at stake and you have a strong position, you're going to attack someone. And you know, I had to recognize it was just a moment. This is a moment in time. It hurt my feelings. But I just kept going. You know? You just keep going. Because that's what people do when they're nervous, when they're scared, when they think things aren't going right, when they think bad things are about to happen to their families, when they read a story that makes them believe that everything they value is at risk. Wouldn't you get pretty self-protecting in that moment? So I have to just make space for that too. There's a phrase that I really love. It's not original with me. It's called transcend and include. The transcending is the first step. Transcending is, oh my goodness, my children are behaving like children. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> they're punching each other. They're mad at each other. They uh, are picking at each other. They're calling each other names. The first place is not to jump into the ring with them and duke it out. How dare you call your sister a name? I thought you knew better by now. What are you doing? We solved this yesterday. How dare you? You know, all that stuff that we do. That's jumping into the ring. So the first thing is transcend. Oh, <laughs> children behaving like children. What a shock. Children who don't quite know how to manage the tumult of their own emotions. Ah, transcend. I am looking down from 30,000 feet. I see what's going on here. I remember being a child. By the way, I've seen other children. I lived in school and watched children bully each other. Oh, it's showing up in my house today. I can transcend it. I'm the adult. I'm the mother. I'm the father. So we transcend. And then we include. Ah, I see this perspective. I see this perspective. How can we bring these together? How can we do it in a way that generates good feeling, that finds common ground, that reserves judgment, that hopes for the best? Do you know hoping for the best is one of the most optimistic, loving things you can do? As much as you disagree with what your kids are saying or a husband said to you, you can still hope for the best. You can. It doesn't mean that the status quo is going to stay the same. I'm all about overturning toxic status quo. So don't ever hear me saying that love means allowing for abusive speech, punching, cruelty, lying, or betrayal. That's not what I'm talking about. But you can still hope for the best because hoping for the best might mean learning how to manage that toxicity in a new way, finding your strength, creating a healthier space for you and all the people in it. So where we start is we transcend, we get the 30,000 foot perspective. What's really going on here? That's the question to ask. And then you can include all the perspectives. You can do research. You can get more information. Remember how we talked about that yesterday? Ah, more information. Ah, I need more information. Ah, I can step back and think about this. Don't have to act on the impulse right now. I can pause. I can transcend and look down. I can include new information. I can include new perspectives. I can include the perspectives of the people who are actually embroiled in the battle. I don't have to simply send them to their corners and tell them to stop feeling what they're feeling. I can include these big emotions and we can help each other learn how to hold them, how to express them, how to manage them. This is the work of parenting. This is the work of homeschooling. Not math. <laughs> You'll get math too. Math gets thrown in for the bargain when you follow this kind of path. 
because once you have harmony and children who know they're respected, you can teach math. You can teach math to a child who's open-hearted, who's connected to you, who sees the value of math because you've bothered to make it valuable. Do you see how this works? Do you see why I harp on this stuff? On why love and empathy and opening and being vulnerable and paying attention and getting more information help your homeschool? This isn't just three tips for teaching fractions. You can't teach fractions to a fractured family. When your kids are fighting writing, there's more to it than that they just think it's boring. Boring is a cover-up. It's not true. Writing is not boring. So when a child says writing is boring, there's a reason. It's a cover-up. It's a label. It's hiding the truth. So to get down into the muck with a child who says it's boring means that you are buying that line. No, they're not telling you the truth. Why is it boring? What about it is boring? I hate what I have to write about. Oh, I see. It's not writing that's the problem. It's that I am forcing you to write about a topic that has no value to you. Yeah, that is boring. There's not a writer on the planet who enjoys that feeling. I got it. And now we have some choices to make. Do we stay with the topic that's boring for whatever the true purpose is? Maybe it's a requirement to send off that essay to a college application. So we're now going to learn how to take a boring topic we don't want to do and still write and find something interesting to us because that's the goal of this project. Or maybe we're only in seventh grade and assigning a topic a child hates is ridiculous. Let them write about what interests them. Let them figure out how to form a connection. Now we're talking. Now we're making headway. Because boring is a cover-up. It's a disguise. It's not the final word. It's the only language available in a moment for self-protection. Our kids say stuff like this all the time. I hate that. That's so boring. It's so hard. I can't stand it. That's just cover-ups. You know, they pick the easiest word that has nothing to do with what's really going on. So love, in this context of the homeschool, means to hope for the best, to give the benefit of the doubt. If my child says writing is boring, we're going to start with the truth of that statement. You know underneath that the subject area of writing isn't boring because whole universes of people have dedicated their lives to writing. It's like me saying math is boring. It can't be. People have been fascinated by mathematics from the dawn of time. So the subject is not intrinsically boring. Any subject you get involved in is not intrinsically boring. When a child says writing is boring, translate it to my child is bored right now while writing. Let's find out more about that boredom. Let's ask the question. Let's give the benefit of the doubt that the child is doing the best job they can to self-report. Benefit of the doubt that the child's telling you the truth according to that child in this moment. Then we hope for the best. If I could understand why my child is bored right now, I might be able to offer an alternative we might be able to overturn the experience of boredom. And you can even pause and think, when am I bored? What helps me get out of that funk? When I'm bored with something, what do I do to fix that? And then we can think, what did I do when I was a child and I was bored? Who listened to me when I was bored? What is one memory I have of someone taking my boredom and transforming it? And then we think, okay, now I've got a few ideas kind of remember things I did when I was bored. I kind of remember what I did yesterday when I was bored. Someone told me yesterday, for example, that they just discovered my Facebook Live and YouTube. She said, for the first time, I love doing laundry. I lock myself in a room, I turn on your YouTubes, and I could do laundry all day. I'm looking for laundry to do. Oh, did she just solve her boredom with laundry? 
<laughs> we solve our boredom all the time. We just don't think about it. And we don't think about applying those very techniques to our own children. The child who's bored doing math would headphones help. This is why I joke and say add brownies because we instinctively know when I say something like brownies that I'm asking you to add something a little whimsical and magical to an experience that feels tedious. We're not saying the experience needs to end. We're trying to reimagine the logistics to enhance the experience. Laundry did not get more interesting because she was listening to YouTubes. Laundry became a way for her to find time in her day to listen to YouTubes. And suddenly, folding clothes felt good it didn't feel like a tedious, mindless, empty task of drudgery. And we all know this. I spent years listening to Jane Austen on books on tape while I made dinner every night. It was my favorite hour of the day. I couldn't wait for five o'clock. I could run to the kitchen, put my kids in front of Arthur. They would watch Arthur and Liberty's Kids and some other PBS show, Wishbone. And I would make dinner and my little tape recorder would be going and I would just get lost you know, in Jane Austen or Mrs. Polifax or any number of great books, dinner time suddenly became fun for me. Can't we do this with our children? We have the skills. It takes a little investigating. Open your mind, open your heart, believe what they say, give the benefit of the doubt, hope for the best, reserve judgment. I know their boredom is inconvenient to you. I know that. Saying math is hard is inconvenient. It's going to make you work harder to deal with the real. But you signed up for this. This is the job you asked for. You had all these cutie pies. And they're so cute. I mean, just go back to how cute they are. Grab those little cheeks. Look at that son who's getting the bigger and bigger shoulders. Be amazed and awed by them before you solve their problems. Pause to notice just what a great job, you know, human beings did at creating this person. You and your husband or you, the people who conceived of this child that you have the privilege of adopting. Look at the beauty of the DNA. Be awed by your own kids before you make a decision about what you're going to do. Imagine how it is for the other person. Get back into a seven-year-old self and imagine Oh, this child has just been asked to sit at a table for 20 whole minutes. You guys know the brain research, right? Children can sustain attention span age plus one minute. So if you have a seven year old, they can give you eight good minutes and you tried to make them sit there for 30 and thought they were lazy because they couldn't do it. Hello, <laughs> they can't do it. Seven year old can give you eight good minutes. What does that mean about a 13 year old? They can give you 14 good minutes. That's discouraging because you thought a 13 year old should be able to give you six good hours. But what if at home you address things in 15 minute increments? Give me 15 good minutes, stand up, walk around, get a bite to eat, come back, give me 15 more. What if you addressed it that way? I don't know, maybe that's possible. Maybe that's possible. Maybe that's a way to approach a subject where that child hasn't developed stamina yet. I think it's a great idea. Imagine how it is for the other person. Allow the one you love to be who they actually are, not the image you wish they were. We talked about this yesterday. Your kids are who they are. They can't be who you want them to be. And it does no good to love the image more than the kid. You cannot fall in love with your idealization of your child, your spouse, your best friend from high school. You must take people as they are. And if we just go back now to the macro of Facebook, what's happening is people are able to exhibit who they really are. Before the internet, you could live with your private belief that your friend might have a different political view, but she never mentions it around you. Now you have to read paragraphs of views that really make you recoil on both sides. Now you are challenged to actually know who your friend is and you get to decide how to love who they actually are, not your idealization, not your fantasy. 
And this is going on in your home right now. To know someone as they are means to actually open yourself to how it is for them. It's not just about accepting and tolerating what you don't agree with. It's seeing the world through their eyes. I know I harp on this, but the foundation of a healthy community is empathy. It is receiving what's offered and then working with that in your friendship, in your marriage, with your children, in your community. It's the reason I am such a nut in Brave Rider about making space for multiple homeschooling perspectives. Does it do us any good to double down on the Brave Rider way when somebody is actually presenting the truth of their experience right now, which is textbooks are awesome for us. I'm a brand new homeschooler and I don't wanna give up the security of my textbooks. Is there any way I can use Brave Writer? What would be the use of me saying, well, textbooks are terrible for children. You really shouldn't use textbooks. You should be reading living, living literature. And in fact, right now you are incurring all kinds of damage. And until you're done with textbooks, Brave Writer won't work for you. How many of you have been in homeschool communities that do exactly that? You know, unschooling won't work for you until you completely abandon everything else over here. That's not how it works. When somebody is exposing who they are, you get to understand first why that creates security for them, why that creates a life for them that feels good, feels normal. And then they might let go of the side of the pool. You might say, try a poetry tea time. It's free. It's fun. <laughs> you can fit that in into any life. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And that's how you can treat your kids. They come to you, oh my gosh, I hate homeschooling. I hate doing schoolwork. How many parents write to me? My child loves playing. He hates school. All right, so then how about playing more? How about actually playing with fractions instead of doing school fractions? How about playing with books instead of reading them? Maybe use books to build houses for Barbies instead of reading them. <laughs> Get the books in the hands of your child. At least let them feel what it's like to hold a book and to lay it this way and to stack them as a tower and to rub them on your face and to smell them and to compare the artwork of one cover to another cover. Why do we think the only valuable way to get to the point where you want to read is to work really hard at letters on a page? There are so many ways to engage books. We could take pictures of them. We could try and draw their covers. We could read all of the labels upside down. We could balance them on our heads and walk around the room. If we want our kids to love something, don't they need to get to know it in a lot of ways? And can't they get there through a lot of means? Do we always have to go back to, but I'll know they love it if they're sitting at a kitchen table with a pencil in their hands? So whatever provides you with security, you can keep doing that and then feather in a little of the fantasy that you're imagining. This is how you love people. This is how you love work and learning and household responsibilities. Keep changing the logistics. Stay open. Get more information. <laughs> and don't be distracted by everyone's hostility. Such a waste of energy. <laughs> Such a waste. You know, the man I'm dating right now, he decided to not watch the news during the next several weeks because, and he's a pretty passionate person usually about politics and we align on most things. And uh, so anyway, yesterday I was telling him something that happened on Facebook and I was describing this one reaction that uh, I even wrote about. And he kind of dismissed it, which hurt my feelings. And then later in the night, something came on and I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, he doesn't even know all the stuff that just went down in our country because he hasn't been paying attention. He's been off of the news and he chose to do that. He chose to do that. Uh, I have someone at my door and so it distracted me right at the end. I have to answer it. So we're going to end abruptly. You can choose your inputs. You can choose what is speaking to you and you can have a peaceful life right now if you want it. Love your friends, love your families, love your community. I'm Julie Bogart. Live honestly, write bravely.
Bye, everybody.